People tend to organize their experiences into patterns. We use these patterns to form what are called mental models. With each new experience, our brain chunks the information into a pile that we use to build up this model of the world around us. Schemas are the word we use for these little chunks of that model. Schemata are the building blocks of knowledge we use to make sense of what we see. They're the things in our head that allow us to form a mental representation of our experiences. The cognitive scientist Barry Wadsworth describes schemata as index cards filed in the brain. These index cards hold information about past experiences, mental images of objects, results from past actions, and little files on more abstract knowledge like chemical reactions or English literature. We use these little index cards to tell us what to do or think when we encounter new stuff. They form the basis of our mental model of the world. Imagine you're an infant, and you have absolutely no mental model of the world around you. You could not make use of past experiences because you have none. You could not integrate the new objects you see with your current understanding because you have no current understanding. Everything would be scary and make no sense because you have no framework for sense making. We build this framework from experiences. We see a stove. That sure looks interesting. When we touch the red hot burner of the stove, or even just get close, it's hot. The heat on our skin hurts. We remember that. It gets filed away in our mind. We now have a model of the world that says that rectangular boxes with the red glowy things at the top are bad to touch. We can tell a child not to touch the stove all day long, but until they have a reason to equate stove plus touch equals bad, or red glowy thing equals hot, and hot equals bad, they will never really learn because it's not yet part of their model of the world. We don't learn anything by simply being told. That's one reason the traditional model for education doesn't work well. Let me give you another example of cognitive model building that you as a big boy or girl can relate to right now. I spent six months living in the Czech Republic. I don't speak Czech. But when I went to a restaurant and the waiter came up to the table and said something that made no sense to me, I knew that he was probably asking what I'd like to drink. I don't need to know the actual words he's saying because I have a model in my mind for how the restaurant experience plays out. May I take your drink order? Disappear while preparing drinks? Return with drinks. Are you ready to order food? The waiter could speak Klingon, and so long as the basic customs are the same, I just have to point at stuff on the menu. I've built a mental model for a restaurant based on past experiences, schema, that is applicable all over the world. How do we develop and sometimes change our mental models? Cognitive scientist Bob Siegler describes the following very relatable scenario. A two-year-old child sees a man who is bald on top of his head and has long, frizzy hair out the sides. To his mother's horror, the toddler shouts, Clown! Clown! The child is assimilating this new experience with his schema for clown. The boy's mother explains to her young son that the man was not a clown and that even though his hair was like a clown's, he wasn't wearing a funny costume and wasn't doing silly things to make people laugh. The boy is able to change, or what we call accommodate, his schema of clown and make this idea fit better to a standard concept of clown. Usually, we accommodate our existing middle mental models without having to fundamentally change them. This is a relatively painless, process, and we usually strive to accommodate in this way as, as much as we can get away with. Our brains are fundamentally lazy. We resist changing fundamental models without significant reasons to do so. This is our challenge as science educators. As an example, I guarantee that at some point in your life you were taught correctly that we have seasons on Earth and why. However, when researchers asked Harvard University graduates, you know, smarty pants, about the causes of the seasons, they got it wrong 90% of the time. We have a pretty simple model, mental model, for hot stuff. Built beginning as a tiny child. As you get closer to big balls of fire, you feel more heat. Remember that rectangular box with the red glowy things? As an adult, you remember that little picture of the Earth's elliptical orbit where the Earth is closer to the sun during certain parts of the year. Naturally, you assume the hot summer comes when the Earth is closer to the big ball of fire we call the sun. It fits our mental model of hot stuff. Since we have no real reason to need a good mental model for the seasons, 
we just keep right on thinking this is the uh, why they exist. But summer doesn't result from being closer to the sun. In fact, it's the earth. When the earth is closest to the sun, it's actually winter in Nebraska. The seasons are the result of the earth's tilt. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense without some serious mental effort. Your mental model is easier. So during that class where you were taught about the tilt of the earth, you just accepted what the teacher had to say to get a good grade, but you didn't actually believe it. To believe it, you would have had to keep those gears turning until that whole tilt thing made sense. And it's kind of complicated and not really relevant to you anyway. However, one day during the summer in Nebraska, you pack your t-shirts for your trip to Buenos Aires, Argentina. You're a little shocked when you arrive and learn that it's winter. All of the sudden, you're in a state of disequilibrium. You have new information that is in direct conflict with your mental model for the seasons. The mind falls back on these mental models that are often left hidden. This can result in students having very different reasons for giving the exact same answers. Maybe they know something, but do they understand it? Do they have a good accurate mental model. If we formulate our questions too narrowly, we will misinterpret the formative feedback we are getting from students and fail to see their thinking. It's important to find out what mental models your students are using. That is the starting point for helping them build more sophisticated and scientific models in their minds about the world around them. To learn more about how we form patterns in our minds, read my book, Teaching Science Thinking. The book contains specific thinking tasks that you can use in your classroom to break down and reconstruct mental models of your students. A link is provided in the description.